All right, let's look at some examples from 1.6. We've already done a few, um, so let's do some more. I'm looking at problem four of this section, which is on page 132. And they tell us in this problem that f of x is going to be defined as the fraction x all over x squared minus 6x plus 8. And g of x is going to be 3 minus x. So, we evaluate in parts A, B, and C. For part A, we look at F plus G at minus 1. And for this, we just look at F of minus 1 and then add that result to G of minus 1. Now, if you didn't like the way I was doing it here, there's kind of a slightly different way you can run these examples. It's really only different in the way it looks. You can say, okay, let's stop here and figure out what f of minus 1 is. Well, this is minus 1 over minus 1 squared minus 6 times minus 1 plus 8 and then work out what is f of minus 1. So this is minus 1 over 1 plus 6 plus 8. So that's 7. 7 plus 8 is 15. So this is minus 1 over 15. And then you can look at, well, what's g of minus 1? Well, g of minus 1 is going to be 3 minus our x value, minus 1. And that is 3 plus 1, or 4. So then our answer, f plus g at minus 1, is going to be f of minus 1 plus g of minus 1 which is minus 1 15th plus 4, which is going to be, uh, 4 is 60 over 15, so that's going to be, if I can add fractions, 59 over 60 is going to be our answer for part A. So you can do that. Before, I was kind of doing each one of these in parallel, you know, solving out what f of x was, finding what g of x was, and then combining the result at the very end. Or you can kind of step aside and do these things one at a time. Figure out what f is, figure out what g is at this x value, and then combine the results. Either way is fine. It's just whichever method you prefer, that's the method you should stick with. So let's take a look at b. Part B of question 4. In this case, we're trying to evaluate f minus g of 0. And this is going to be f of 0 minus g of 0. And I'll do this alternate method uh, one more time to give you more of a sense of how it works, and then I'll go back to the way I was doing it before. So we start off by working off on the side to figure out what f of 0 is. Now f of x was x, that's now 0, all over x squared, this becomes 0 squared since we're saying x equals 0 here, minus 6x, so that's 6 times 0, plus 8. So we have what is this? This is 0 over 0 minus 0 plus 8. Well, that's 0 over 8, which is 0. g of 0 
is 3 minus our x value, 3 minus 0. So g of 0 is 3. So our answer here is going to be 0 minus 3, which is a minus 3. Part C, f times g at 2. So I'm going to go back to the way I normally do these now. That's going to be f of 2 times g of 2. Because that's just how we're defining it to be. It's kind of a very natural way of defining this operation. So f of 2 is 2 over 2 squared minus 6 times 2 plus 8. And g of 2 is 3 minus 2. So this is 2 over 4 minus 12 plus 8 times 1. And so then we have 2 over 4 minus 12 is minus 8, so this is 0. 1, and we have a problem. We have a problem because we have a 0 in the denominator. So this is undefined, which we'll talk about in the next problem we work, because we're going to talk about when we combine functions, how does the domain of the combination work? And in this case, F, the domain of F was that you couldn't plug in 2, and I don't think you could plug in x equals 4 either. So if F has the restriction that x can't be 2 and the restriction that x can't be 4, then this product of the two is going to have those same restrictions as well because we're going to end up computing F at 2 or F at 4 and getting a undefined result. Now, if we look at d, this is f over g of x, and so this we define to be f of x over g of x. And, oops, it wasn't uh, f of x, it was f of 1, I'm sorry. We're just plugging in numbers right now. So f of 1 is going to be 1 over 1 squared minus 6 times 1 plus 8. That's on top, and on bottom is going to be 3 minus 1. So we have 1 over 1 minus 6 plus 8, and that's over 2. So we have 1 over 1 minus 6 is uh, minus 5, minus 5 plus 8 is a 3. So 1 third divided by 2, a third divided by 2 is the same thing as a third times the reciprocal of 2, 1 half. So our answer is 1 sixth. Okay. Let's take a look at this kind of domain and range example. So if I look at number problem 10, we have that f of x is 1 minus 1 over x and g of x is 1 over x. So the domain of f, what could go wrong in f? Well, we can't take square roots of negatives, there's no square roots, but we do have denominators. So the only way 
And the bad thing with denominators is when the denominators are zero. So the only way the denominator here could be zero is if x equals zero. So the domain of f is simply that x can't be zero. Because otherwise, any other value, we can do one over any non-zero number. We just can't do one over zero. And for g, coincidentally, it's the same thing. There are no square roots, so we don't have to worry about taking square roots of negatives. But we do have a denominator. So that denominator, x, can't be zero. So the domain of f and the domain of g is simply that x cannot be equal to zero. So let's take a look at a f plus g of x. Well, that's just going to be f of x plus g of x. And to find this, it's f minus 1 over x plus g of x, which is 1 over x. And so that's just 1 minus 1 over x plus 1 over x, which is 1. And it looks like 1, in and of itself, it has no domain restrictions because there's no denominators, no square roots. You know, this is just a constant function. But the thing is, how did we get to this 1? We got to 1 by plugging x into f and x into g. And the problem values of x are just x equals 0. If x equals 0, we're going to run into a problem here and here when we look at f of 0 and g of 0. So the domain of f plus g is, again, that x cannot be 0. Even though the final result has no restrictions whatsoever, how we got there does have restrictions. You know, along this way, x, you know, in these various steps here, x can't be 0. This is the only time, the last step is the only time when we have no restrictions. But if you have restrictions at anywhere along this point, they have to be included in the domain. So if we look at b, f minus g of x, this is f of x minus g of x, and f of x is 1 minus 1 over x minus g of x, which is 1 over x. So this is 1 minus 1 over x minus 1 over x. These two fractions have the same denominator. So I can combine the numerators. Minus 1 minus 1 is a minus 2. So that was our answer for part A. This is part of our answer for part B. We just need to state what the domain is. Well, you can see that, in this case, again, x can't be 0, because that's going to have us divide by 0. That's going to force us to have a 0 denominator. So not only in the final result do we have this restriction, but we also have it at every step along the way. So this isn't a very tricky one. You can just look at the final answer, find out the domain, and that's the domain of the whole thing. C asks us to look at f times g of x. So this is 1 minus 1 over x times 1 over x. So if we distribute, that's 1 times 1 over x minus 1 over x times 1 over x. 
and 1 times anything is just itself. So 1 times 1 over x is just 1 over x, and 1 over x times 1 over x just multiply straight across. 1 times 1 is 1, x times x is x squared. And that's our result. And again, we have denominators. The denominators can't be 0. So x can't be 0. If x the only way x squared is 0 is if x is 0. So that doesn't add anything new to our restrictions. So f times g, again, still has that same restriction as f and g had, that x can't be 0. Now, if we look at d, this is f over g of x, which is 1 minus 1 over x over 